my passion is in uh, death and dying. And that's <laughs> but no, I, I actually, I get really passionate about uh, microorganisms that cause disease. And I, I actually, I work uh, not only on orchids. I, I, uh, I have an ornamental appointment in that I focus primarily on tropical foliage. Uh, but, you know, down in, in Homestead in the Redland area, we have a fair number of uh, orchid growers. And, and, it, and the, the orchid group, uh, fascinating people in, in orchids, uh, truly fascinating. And this is a, a really uh, neat opportunity for me to be here and, and uh, learn about cattleyas. Um, one of the things um, I always mention uh, when you deal with trying to diagnose a plant disease, you can talk to the plant all day long, but they don't talk back. And, and so it's, it's really challenging working with a patient that can't tell you uh, what's going on. And so uh, there's, um, having said that, you know, there's, there's a lot of anecdotal information out there. Uh, there's a lot of uh, speculation when it comes to diagnostics. It's just the nature of the game. So um, you really have to uh, do your homework, uh, learn a lot about the horticulture uh, that pertains to the plants you're, 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 uh, you're working on. And I have to say, uh, you folks here are definitely experts when it comes to, to orchids. Uh, I, I don't hold a candle to, to what you know uh, about orchids. Um, but one thing I do day in and day out is I work with the, de de the organisms that cause uh, diseases. So hopefully I'll be able to pass something on to you uh, this morning. Uh, you'll learn something because I'm definitely uh, learning a lot <laughs> about cattleyas. Um, so I mentioned, you know, the plants can't talk back to us. Um, so that, that, that's definitely a challenge. And one of the first things, uh, points I like to make when talking about diagnostics is that to determine that a real problem exists. And the example I give um, uh, they, uh, that's pretty common is when we get turf samples from somebody's front yard. Uh, and then we finally, we figure out that it's an area of the grass where the dog's been peeing. And, and, that, and that does happen quite frequently. Uh, and so, you know, but when we get a sample in a lab and, you know, it is what it is. I mean, we get a sample and sometimes you really have to go out and visit the field or visit the location to figure out what the heck's going on because you're only getting a piece of the puzzle. Um, one of the things you need to do is if in, let's just say your, your orchid collection, uh, you want to look for patterns. Uh, if, do you see the same types of symptoms showing up on, uh, is, it, is it specific to a species, specific to a hybrid? Is it specific just to a type of orchid? Uh, also, uh, what, you know, what type of the tissue is it affecting? Is it, did it start on our roots? Did it start up uh, in the upper portion of the plant? Um, another thing that's really important is looking at the time of symptom development. A lot of the organisms that cause disease are gonna be a reoccurring theme. You're gonna see them around the same time of the year each and every year. And that's because the conditions are favorable for that disease process to occur. Um, and then of course, you can, you can ask yourself uh, a lot of questions about you know, what was done to the plants. Uh, it, did something change with the irrigation? Did something change with the, the fertilizer? Did you put on a pesticide that you've never used before? Uh, and then again, it's, it's, it's like putting the, the pieces of the, the puzzle uh, together. And this, is a, uh, this slide just shows uh, a classic e example of, of how difficult diagnostics can be. Because when I look at this symptom here and I look at this symptom here, I think they look very similar. You have water-soaked tissue, it's turning yellow or chlorotic, um, but in fact, the one on the left is actually a, a fungal infection, and the one on the right is, is, is soft rot bacteria. So don't let that fool you. Sometimes when you just have a soft, rotting mesh, you think, oh, this is, a, this is bacteria, and it may indeed be a fungus or a fungal-like pathogen. 
And if you're using chemistry, that's really important because these, th these uh, fungicides are, are very specific and bactericides. And um, so that, that, especially from a, from a commercial point of view, uh, you really got to know what you're, what you're dealing with. Um, the other point I like to make uh, when I talk about uh, diagnostics is uh, these things that are abiotic or non-living. And that's, and that's really uh, what can be challenging. And it, like I mentioned, I just don't work on orchids. I work on tropical foliage, uh, a lot of landscape problems. And as you can imagine, um, it's, it's always a very interesting uh, area to be in. I, in fact, I've, I've been on cases where uh, there was a homeowner that thought they had some kind of unusual fungus in the yard and, and I went out there and I'd never seen anything like it. It turns out it was uh, pieces of a dog's toy that looked like mushroom or fungal like structures. And I, you know, and without having access to a microscope, it was I mean, the most bizarre thing. So, yeah, it, it never, uh, it's never a dull moment. Um, but some of the things that, that can cause uh, symptoms that uh, can mimic or look similar to those caused by living pathogens. Of course, nutrient imbalances. Uh, we have a, a fair number of uh, temperature extremes and, of course, chemicals, mechanical damage, which could be induced uh, by insects or even wind damage, water imbalances, and then genetic defects. And so just going to show you a few um, uh, slide shots of things that have come into the diagnostic clinic. And, of course, uh, in South Florida, we don't get cold very often, but when we, when we do get these Arctic blasts, it can be devastating to, uh, to plants. Um, and, and when you see something where generally uh, the tissue uh, turns, uh, turns white or bleached out like this, uh, often it becomes water soaked and just rots. It, very, it looks very close to something like ba uh, bacterial soft rot. And that's because bacteria move in on the compromised tissue. So there are bacteria there, but the primary issue in this case uh, was, uh, was cold damage. And then the same thing, um, just from a different uh, angle, this is a phalaenopsis. Now this uh, was an example of a, a homeowner that, that bought a phalaenopsis and had it in the back seat of the car, sat in there on a hot day. Yeah, just like, I mean, just uh, devastating. And of course, you get the, the, the sun magnification through the, the window and then just, just burnt, uh, burn up the, the orchid. So a uh, horrible thing to do to your orchid. And then, of course, uh, people have heard of edema, which is a buildup of water. It happens in, in people, and you can, be, you can spell it with an O or without. Um, it, the edema also happens to a whole number of different uh, plants. And you take a, a, a close-up, there's no sign or evidence of a pathogen here because this is a physiological uh, response. And so what's happening here is that these cells are just filling up with water. And then often, depending on the species, you'll get some reddish discoloration. That's uh, pigment buildup or anthocyanescence in the plant. And um, depending on what species you're looking at, right now you can go in a landscape and look at Exora, and it's a beautiful example of edema, especially where you have uh, uh, hedges or, or tight uh, plantings of, of Exora. Uh, it looks like a red leaf spot. Is it uh, blister-like? It's a blister-like, yeah, blister -like. exactly. And, and so the shame, it's a shame because a lot of people think think it's a disease and they spray the heck out of it. Uh, often it's, it's linked with iron uh, deficiency, um, but, but the bottom line is, is, is we see it under uh, closely or dense plantings, high relative humidity, poor air movement, you can get edema to show up, but then at the same time we see it in orchids in the trees uh, when the ambient, the air temperature cools down going into winter, uh, you'll see edema show up. That, th these are just observations. Um, and so the other uh, one that, that's a real humdinger is the mesophyll cell collapse. And uh, this one's often mistaken for insect damage or mechanical damage or snail feeding damage. Um, but really uh, what's happened here 
is you, you just you get these the the mesophyll layer of the cells that uh, collapses and then eventually opportunistic organisms move in and make matters worse. Uh, there, I had a grad student uh, a few years ago that was was able to show this with cold water on a hot day. And so you may see where you've got uh, condensation dripping in a house where uh, the leaf surface is really hot, the water is really cold, and it can damage the cells. That's one way to induce uh, mesophyll cell collapse. Uh, there, there may be others uh, that you're familiar with, uh, but, and it comes in, in different uh, uh, variation. You can see here it's not so pronounced or, or, or deep. In, in case this, this one, they're really dug, dug in there, and this is more superficial. Um, but it, it's a problem on, on orchids especially, but we see it um, on, on other plants as, as well. Uh, and then, um, of course, this is not a Cattleya, this is an Oncidium, but uh, the, these bizarre things uh, that happen, and I've talked to people that say that theirs don't do this, and they, they may be a very good horticulturist or have the right environmental conditions. But when I first came uh, into uh, diagnostics in South Florida and got involved with orchids. I threw the book at this thing because I thought it looked like a, a leaf spot, but it, it, it's definitely not caused by a pathogen. You may see some fungus or bacteria move in on these spots, but this is a, a truly just a, a gen genetic by environment interaction. Um, so. Uh, it's a beautiful orchid, and uh, I don't mind the, the spots, and some of you who are really good orchid growers probably don't have the spots, but my collection, I have the spots. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so now I want to move in and talk about the, the uh, things that fascinate me, which are the, the fungi and fungal-like uh, organisms, bacteria and, and viruses, and, you know, uh, just for... A textbook, you know, a pathogen is an organism that is capable of changing the physiological processes of a plant, thus causing disease, and, and this term pathogenic just means disease causing or having the ability uh, to cause disease. And then this is really important, and, and this is kind of a, a take home uh, concept. Disease just doesn't happen. Okay, so you've got to have your susceptible hosts, which are the, the orchids or the cattleyas for this group. Um, you have to have the presence of a, uh, a pathogen. And then, most importantly, the environmental conditions have to be favorable for disease to occur. Uh, the environment truly drives the whole process. And unfortunately, uh, it's speaking for folks in Florida, uh, we have an environment that's highly favorable for disease. And, and I mean, South Florida is just a mecca. Uh, and that's why I, I enjoy being a plant pathologist in, in South Florida because it's, it's truly a challenge. I think the subtropics are even more challenging than, trop than the tropics. And the reason for that is because we try to grow a lot of tropical things that are stressed out. Uh, and they're more predisposed to, to disease. And so we see a lot of, of disease in, in Florida. Um, but so those three things, the susceptible host, the presence of a pathogen, and the environment, okay, have to be there for disease to happen. And then this, of course, uh, people, we definitely play a role because we certainly move the plants, and we also move the pathogen. So um, that's the... The take-home point, uh, if you will, about, uh, about plant disease. Um, and then, so one of the most, um, I, I think, infamous, uh, <laughs> I like to say famous, uh, diseases, of course, is uh, black rot. Um, black rot is caused primarily by a fungal-like organism called Phytophthora. For many years, it was considered a fungus, and uh, with the advent of molecular technology and learning more about these things, we've discovered that it's not a fungus, it's, it's uh, actually more closely related to a water mold. And having said that, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense because it's often associated with, with rain and it's associated with irrigation water and that's often how it, how it enters into uh, an orchid collection. But it's na the common name black rot is because the tissue uh, nine out of ten times is going to turn dark brown to black 
and associated with uh, infection from this pathogen. Phytophthora in, uh, it, you know, in Latin um, is translated to plant destroyer. And Phytophthora infestans uh, was the organism responsible for the Irish potato famine. So if you have any folks uh, that, of an Irish descent, um, it just wiped, wiped out uh, uh, potatoes. And uh, we, we received a lot of Irish folks um, in, in the United States because of uh, people moving away uh, to survive. Um, so this is a very devastating uh, pathogen. Now the species um, is not in festans on orchids. It's a different species, but there's actually two. But again, you see the, the black, the dark brownish uh, black discoloration. Sometimes you'll see the organism sporulating on the tissue. Here's a, a, a great example of, of sporulation. Um, there's actually two species of Phytophthora, uh, Phytophthora palmivora and, and Phytophthora cactorum that are uh, responsible for causing black rot. They're, on occasion, we see Pythium, which is a closely related organism, uh, but uh, more common um, are Phytophthora. Uh, palmivora more so in, in subtropical, tropical climate, and then cactorum in more of the temperate uh, uh, climate. But, this is like a, you can imagine this to be like a water balloon, uh, and then that's full of thousands of microscopic spores. I mean, this is microscopic in itself, but you'll get thousands of these big uh, lemon balloon-shaped structures, and then those in, ha have little tiny motile spores that swim and infect. So this is a very fast-acting um, uh, pathogen and uh, unfortunately if it's if if it's a uh, the conditions are favorable enough uh, it can it can kill uh, plants it, it can be very devastating and lead to fatality um, the biggest thing is there the both species have a, a, a fairly wide host range uh, a lot of grasses um, are susceptible palmivora for example goes to bromeliads it goes to palm trees uh, we've done a few new reports on some of the, the uh, new uh, foliage plants that they get uh, Phytophthora palmivora. So it's possible that you get Phytophthora bud rot in a palm tree. You've got an orchid in that palm, and subsequently the orchid could, could uh, become infected. So um, that's, uh, but weeds definitely, you want to control weeds because they can potentially harbor uh, the pathogen. And it's all about. Uh, the canopy being dry. Uh, the leaf wetness period um, is uh, the major factor for infection. So if you have a period of dry foliage, you're ahead of the game, okay? Because if it dries out on the leaf surface where the primary infection occurs, it can also infect the roots as well, but I'm just talking on the, the for the, the foliar infection, uh, you, if you have a period where those leaves are dry, you're, you're ahead of the game. Um, and then there's a whole number of, the good thing is this, this group of organisms called the oomyces, that's the Phytophthora, Pythium, Downy mildews, uh, there's a whole number of chemistries that are highly effective uh, for co controlling this group of, of, of pathogens. And I can, I can share this, uh, this presentation with anyone that would want to take home these, uh, these notes. And I also will show you some things that are available online. But one thing I want to point out is we have a, uh, a fungicide resistance action committee um, that works on trying to minimize the potential for resistance to occur in pathogen populations. And the, the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, the acronym is FRAC, F-R-A-C, and on every new pesticide label, <coughs> fungicides, I'm talking more specifically, and bactericides in case of disease, has a, a FRAC group code on it. And that group code, like here you can see the, the phosphatidyl aluminum, this, is, this would be called Aliette, is a, is a trade name or any of the phosphonates, uh, you're going to see group 33 on that label. It's really important because if you're a commercial grower, you, what I would recommend is you come in and you get three different products 
from different groups and then you can rotate those chemistries and never have to worry about the pathogen population becoming uh, resistant because I can tell you in our climate these microorganisms crank and they can very easily mutate and overcome uh, resistance. Uh, have you tried the, uh, are you saying that the strobes would be good for orchids? Have they been used in orchids? I, I have used heritage. Uh, now, I, what I would recommend with, like, if you've got a prize collection, definitely test on a, on a small number of plants. I, I use heritage on, we've got cattleyas, bandas, a mixture of things in my, in, in my house. I haven't had any problems. Okay. Uh, that's a zoxystrobin. Once a year, yes, the first one. Yeah, uh, and then um, the other one I have used also is the pyroclostrobin. There's a product called Pageant has pyroclostrobin and boscolid. I haven't had any, any problems. You've used pageant? Yeah, I have used pageant. And, and uh, it's, a, it's an excellent product uh, in terms, you know, these are the strobilirins, this group 11, where is that, there it is there. Uh, very broad spectrum. Um, they're not just gonna work against Phytophthora, they're also gonna work against a lot of the leaf spot uh, pathogens. I think that's the, and they also are, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, no, Xeritol is, is, is actually very good. The, the one thing about Xeritol you've got to be concerned about is that it's all about timing. I've done trials, um, like I did a, recently I did a, a trial with botrytis on geraniums, and Xeritol, when we got it out at the right time, uh, worked, worked uh, great. It, it's definitely an effective product. Xeritol, for those of you uh, who want to know, is actually... Uh, it's a um, hydrogen dioxide and parasitic acid. And, and peroxide. peroxide, that's right. <laughs> and I know I always get the question, if, I, if you take hydrogen peroxide over the counter, yeah, uh, I've, we've, we've uh, played around from a disinfectant standpoint. Um, there's definitely some efficacy. But again, these, these particular commercial products are formulated to give you a little bit more residual activity to hang around, in some cases are actually taken up by the plant and, and are systemic. The, the group up here, the group 33, uh, highly systemic. And they move in the roots uptake the product and also the leaves and it moves both directions in the plant. Phenomenal uh, movement and these uh, can actually, you can find the phosphonates sold as both fertilizers and fungicides. Um, and they will have, in, in most cases, the, 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 if it's the phosphorus acid, you'll see the same efficacy against things like Phytophthora. I think there's another, another question. Yeah, we've heard a lot of growers here commonly use the, some of these systemics on a monthly basis. Are you talking about doing a rotation on a monthly basis I, or more like use one per year and then use another one for another year? Oh, no, I would rotate. What, my, my rule of thumb, in, especially in a, in, a, in a climate like Florida, would be to not do more than two sequential applications. So for example, if you're using, let's say heritage. Subdue and Aliette. Okay, subdue and Aliette, perfect example. So I would, yeah, I would do like, if you, if you put out this month subdue and you, you can even do another month of subdue, then switch to the Aliette. And yeah, because the subdue is uh, the metal axle, which is a uh, group four. And methanoxum, metal axle is the same, metal axle is the old, term, uh, that would be like rotating a group four with a group 33. Yeah, that's a, that's a good rule of thumb. No more than two sequential applications of, of one group. And uh, again, because what often happens is people see a phenomenal response to a new uh, pesticide and then they want to use it again because they're seeing this. In some cases, you may even get growth response from some of these products. Uh, just be careful because the, the pathogens do, uh, do mutate rather quickly. Yeah, I was just curious about TFA, methyl, what group it's in, and I didn't see it on your list. Okay, yeah, they, you'll see that one coming up. The, the, the thiophanate methyl um, is not registered for use against Phytophthora or the oomyces. It's a, that's a true fungicide, and we'll, I'll talk about that. Oh, the, uh, the, the, you're going to see Spectro 90 is going to be thiophanate methyl with chlorothalonil. 
Oh, the etch okay, now that's etrodiazole, yeah. And yeah, the band rot, that's an oldie but a goodie. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the uh, etrodiazole is the portion that would, be, that would work against Phytophthora. And then the thiophanate methyl, now thiophanate methyl will actually ha has some efficacy against Fusarium. Um, and yeah, you, we'll, we'll mention that one. Um, so uh, Fusarium wilt is, is, is definitely a fatal disease. Uh, and it was, I believe, it was in Ohio that they found the long time ago Fusarium oxysperum forma species Cattleya, uh, named after a, a Cattleya because it, w it, it was killing um, some some Cattleyas in a, a collection. And Fusarium wilt pathogens are normally very host specific, often at the uh, the species or even the hybrid level. Uh, and, but the, there are a, some different isolates. In this case, what we, we see more so um, wilt on, we see it more on Vandas than we do on Cattleyas. Um, but it does uh, affect Cattleyas. But on Vandas, it, it, really what happens is the, the orchid starts to dry out. Even though you're watering it, it's, it, it just appears like it's not taking up water. And, and that's the easiest symptom. And then oftentimes you'll start seeing chlorosis or yellowing uh, uh, associated with the, 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 lower, the lower leaves and then, it, and then it works its way up. So it's really working from the, from the bottom up. And often with a fusarium infection, you're gonna see this reddish purplish uh, discoloration. Uh, that's typical and then you may see uh, deep rotten pits into the into the uh, it, uh, uh, into the tissue and here's an example there uh, but the the key is if your plants not responding to water uh, that's a very uh, a good chance you're dealing with fusarium and one of the things that happens is this fungus infects the orchid and then the orchid's immune system tries to respond to that infection by, by creating uh, gamoses and xyloses, these things inside the cell that clog up the xylem or the water conducting uh, tissue. And basically it just, uh, it, it, it shuts down because it's trying to wall off that infection. And um, now the one thing I think it's really important to understand is that if you submit a sample to any random lab or if some, let's say you hire a, a consultant that comes out and says, well, you've got fusarium here. Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're dealing with a pathogen. And you may even have a case where you've got a wound and you've got fusarium growing on that wound and it's not even a player in that situation because fusarium, I can take a piece of my shoestring and isolate fusarium. There are uh, species that are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They're a very common mold uh, problem in, in buildings, um, but there are species and isolates within a species that are very uh, much pathogenic to plants. Uh, but be careful that you're, you know, put the symptoms with the pathogen uh, uh, to make a diagnosis. You definitely want to uh, be careful about um, making quick decisions about you've got a, a disaster with fusarium and it may not be uh, as big of a problem. Uh, the fusarium on, on orchids in general has been isolated and reported to cause root rots, basal stem rots, leaf spots, and of course vascular wilts. When you do have a problem with fusarium, it's a very difficult uh, fungal pathogen to, uh, to eliminate. Um, the one thing is it's uh, a very aggressive, uh, it can stick around on, it can go from your orchid to something that's dead and still survive for long periods of time. So if you get an infestation of, let's say, Fusarium oxysporum form of species Cattleya, uh, you're in trouble because it's going to stick around unless you go through and just clean house and because and, it'll live and the nooks and crannies of, of, of everything. Uh, and so um, it's, it's really difficult to eradicate uh, this, this pathogen. The good thing is from a preventative standpoint, uh, there's some really good chemistry out there. And so uh, if you 
have had a case where you suspect or you've confirmed fusarium wilt problems, you know, the, the best thing to do is take preventative uh, action and um, use a rotation. Again, you can, you can pick from several of these different uh, groups. And there's, there's the, uh, the thiophanate methyl, which is in uh, uh, group one. And so something like Banrite, I, I, I avoid putting uh, trade names because it always, sometimes with, when companies are present, it can lead to arguments. And <laughs> so I like to just deal with active ingredients and then you can, you can look for the, the products. They have. But on my uh, website, we have more uh, trade names uh, uh, mentioned. But there, so there's, there are a number of, of uh, fungicides available for fusarium, but the bottom line is it's all about uh, keeping things clean and, and, and prevention. I always tease the bug people, the entomologist, because when I see bugs, you spray them, you can kill them. But with disease, it doesn't work that way. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to, to deal with, uh, with a microorganism than it is a, a, uh, a bug. So with that one, then, uh, we're, we're doing this on a prophylactic basis. You're not curing the problem. I think that's the key part. That's, that's a really good point. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's a that's a really good point. Yeah, you you really have to. Uh, it's all about good sanitation and 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 prevention. And you have a question in the back. Uh, well, that's not quite accurate. Many years ago, Donna Richardson, who worked for George Martin, worked in pharmaceutical, came up with a formula that you're interested. It is a countless of my plants with uh, I was trying to deal on an individual basis. Not a spray. See, this is the stuff I find fascinating, and it's, yeah, no, I would, because uh, I do, I hear about a lot of these cases where, where people uh, have done, uh, you know, really, really good control measures, or, uh, so I would be interested in, because in, I won't remember that recipe, but I'd be interested in, in, in trialing it, because, um, yes? So you're killing on contact, yeah. Yes. Um, so another uh, disease that we see very common this time of year uh, is called southern blight. Um, and the, the pathogen is, is sclerotium rolfsii, or actually now they're, they're calling it a, a, a thelia uh, rolfsii. Uh, but the, what, w one of the things that I notice on, on some of the uh, vandaceous orchids is that you get this palm tree uh, like effect. And again, this is one that I see much more common on Vandas uh, than we do on, on, on others. But Cattleyas are, are definitely susceptible uh, to this fungus. And one of the ways to identify it, now what I did here is I just, I just peeled back a leaf axle. 
uh, and this is, a, this is the, the fungus. Uh, these are called sclerotia. Uh, they're about the size of a mustard seed, and when you see these, this is a dead ringer for this pathogen. So you know you're dealing with the southern blight fungus. This is another fungus that has a very wide host range, um, goes to a number of bedding plants and also uh, uh, other foliage plants. And so um, it's, it's one that just like, oops, just like uh, Fusarium, you really have to uh, clean your act up if, if you find uh, this, this organism. It's, it's, uh, it can be very difficult uh, to, to eradicate. Uh, so what I recommend uh, to growers in, in the Redland area, and, and um, I know Martin Moats is one that's uh, uh, very, very active against this disease, uh, and uh, Bill Peters as well, is that they use uh, one particular fungicide, I'll, I'll, um, and that's uh, uh, one that has flu flutolanil, highly effective if you have issues with sclerotium rolfsii or southern blight. Um, and they generally start to use it this time of the year uh, in a preventative uh, manner. It's a group seven. Um, it's called either ProStar or, uh, or uh, Contrast and uh, highly effective against both uh, the southern blight organism and also Rhizoctonia, um, and the, which, are, which are closely related. But you can um, also uh, use uh, things like biologicals. Um, if, if they're used uh, according to the manufacturer's label in, in the right manner, uh, they can definitely uh, be effective. And again, um, I always mention if, if you're a good grower uh, and you're doing the right horticultural things and keeping the plants uh, happy and healthy, a disease is probably uh, a, a minor thing. Um, really, it's all about uh, the, the, the health of the, the plant. Um, but so those, those pathogens I just spoke about are, can, can kill orchids. Um, so it's, it's important that those are kind of the, 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 big, the, uh, the big players. Now I'm going to show you some of the things that are just more about uh, the effect, the aesthetic quality of, of the plants. And you have a question? Yeah, you have uh, biological. I do, I, I do have a list, I'll, I'll show you a website where we have a list of, of biologicals, but just like some of the chemicals, some of these are very specific. Like you have an organism that's specific for bacterial pathogens, you have one that's specific for fungal pathogens, um, and then you have some that are more broad spectrum. But the, a lot of the biologicals, uh, because they are living organisms and the environment can affect the efficacy, the environment can also affect the efficacy of, of uh, fungicide but, or synthetic fungicide. But uh, it's, it's all about kind of, you know, you have to go on a program. You have to really take an effort if you want to see good success. There are some growers that use biologicals and, and have phenomenal uh, uh, control. Um, there, in some cases, they're the only thing that can really uh, uh, help help out a situation, especially when there's a soil-borne issue. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll uh, show you a website where you can get more information. Uh, I want to keep trying to move along here. So so anthracnose, uh, which you know you hear about anthracnose on a whole number of different plants. It affects fruits. Uh, you, I'm sure people are familiar with probably anthracnose on avocados. There's anthracnose on citrus, uh, and there's also anthracnose on orchids. Generally, you get this, uh, some people refer to this as like a target spot or this, but this concentric lesion, uh, and, and th this is the actual, the little structures sporulating in the tissue. And then when they're on the margin, you'll see the striation um, on the leaf tissue. So this is uh, evidence of the, the fungus. And if you go up and you look under a microscope, you see these these structures, we call these a cervuli, and, and, and these are like uh, little cannons that produce all these little gelatinous spores. And this fungus, uh, Calitotricum, there's, there's a couple different species associated with orchids, uh, but they uh, are very much great opportunists. They will jump on uh, when, the, when the plant's stressed, they can be, uh, be problematic, and also, 
uh, they're, they're problematic when you have mechanical damage from, from insects. They, they move in and, and make matters worse. Uh, Phyllosticta uh, capitolensis is a fungus that's been long associated with, uh, with orchids. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen so many uh, infections that, like, I, I can recognize the spot, but I don't, I don't know how... It's, it, but one thing is oftentimes they're, they're angular, uh, generally black, little peppered-like spots. But the problem is those peppered spots coalesce or come together and, and often uh, form like an angular uh, type spot as it progresses. And here's an example where you get a large portion of the leaf. And, and this is a glamour shot of Phyllosticta. This is called a, a pycnidium, and you can see this, this little thing here produces all these little spores. So those are blowing in the wind, they're splashing in the water. And again, this is one, you may have a hybrid that's more susceptible. That's, that's just uh, the name of the game. You, there may be a species that's more, more susceptible. Um, but this fungus has a pretty wide host range, affects a number of genera of, uh, of orchids. Um, and uh, it's again, it's it's just it causes a nasty leaf spot. Um, I I recommend home to homeowners all the time is if it if it looks like this this here, you know, you can go in and and, and just physically you know uh, remove the leaf, and then you're removing the inoculum or the the amount of that that pathogen. Is, is and Oh yeah, yeah. There's some there's some good fungicides from uh, definitely from a preventative standpoint. I'll I'll show a slide in just a minute. Um, and so now you've also heard of Cercospora. Uh, well, it turns out that as uh, things evolve, uh, the the mycologists, the fungal taxonomists, have taken the species associated with orchids, the several species associated with orchids, and now they're they're actually called Pseudocercospora. <laughs> So, uh, but that the, it's all the same. I mean, so a lot of the, a lot of your your fungicide labels will still say Cercospora, uh, and that's fine. It, but in essence, it's it's the way the the spores are formed is actually different from a true cer, uh, Cercospora. Uh, so cer, pseudo Cercospora, often with pseudo Cercospora, you're going to see either uh, reddish purplish discoloration in the lesion that's, that's very consistent with a lot of the Pseudocercospora species. So you can see these spots kind of look purplish. And then also, in some cases, you're going to get beautiful yellow halos or margins. Now, this is uh, typical for a number of different pathogens, but with Pseudocercospora, you're going to find evidence uh, often of the fungus sporulating. This fungus likes to sporulate on the underside of the leaf tissue, but sometimes you may see it go through the entire leaf, uh, especially on some of the thinner uh, leaf species. But um, if, and one of the things I want to mention, if it sporulates and grows more readily on the underside of the leaf, when you're using something that's not systemic in the plant, like a, like a copper or, or a sulfur or something that's, that's not going to move in the plant, you're going to want to get really good contact. You're going to want to make sure you're getting the underside of the leaves sprayed. Another example of, uh, of Pseudocercospora, again, reddish like purplish uh, lesions. And then I can't leave out Botrytis. Um, Botrytis is a, another leaf spot. Uh, and it also affects the, the flowers. Uh, it's a huge problem in the cut flower industry. Uh, when conditions are favorable, uh, this fungus can just be uh, a, real, a real disaster. Um, it, the spores move like uh, wildfire, and, and um, it can be, it can be a, a big problem uh, from an aesthetic standpoint. Uh, very few infections of, of uh, botrytis that they, they can get into the, uh, uh, botrytis can get into pseudobulbs and can cause actual rots, believe it or not, but it's not a real real common uh, situation. It's more of a, a, a foliar uh, problem. And the, the main thing is, is, again, it all comes down to sanitation. Never introduce something that is symptomatic unless it's uh, near and dear to your heart and it's part of the collection. And, you know, uh, a lot of the, the breeder types 
<laughs> I love going through those <laughs> collections because there's, there's often a lot of different uh, uh, pathogens uh, present. But the, the, uh, if you want to keep things clean, just uh, it's always going to be a, uh, uh, an uphill battle, so to speak, if you start with disease material. Um, that, that's really important. So just uh, do your homework and look, uh, examine plants closely. Uh, the other thing is, again, that leaf wetness period is really important. If you allow the plants a period where the leaves dry out, those, those spores are, are going to dry out as well. And then also, if the, the right moisture is not there for the infection process, uh, it's going to be uh, um, a better chance or, or it's going to lead to, uh, to less disease. Um, just some points about you know, watering um, in the morning. Uh, this applies to the, the, the commercial growers, ornamental growers in South Florida and, and probably all throughout Florida. Uh, generally use overhead irrigation. It's, I tell them time in and time out, remove the overhead irrigation and you're going to remove a lot of your problems. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's all about, I, I mean, I'm not paying the bill. <laughs> and, and, and it's a complete, you know, we, we have an abundance of water, uh, so they, they have a tendency to do it. Plus, they also have that, uh, the overhead in place for the potential for a, a a uh, frost event and whatnot, but from a from a an aesthetic quality and uh, to reduce the number of foliar problems, uh, dry leaves are often uh, the the way to go. Um, now, from a in general, when managing leaf spot pathogens, um, if the, the species you're dealing with, uh, there are copper formulations. I use oftentimes as copper count N um, on orchids. I don't have any problems. Uh, you know, bromeliads are a different ball game. And there may be some orchids out there that, that are highly uh, uh, susceptible or you can, so you're gonna wanna be very careful about the product that you use. Chlorothalonil is a very uh, broad spectrum uh, fungicide. It's, it's an incredible fungicide. Um, it, it's probably one of the, one of the best. Uh, uh, that's uh, Dacanil is a trade name. Um, it's, it's, uh, you don't really have to worry about disease resistance. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, because it's a multi-site mode of action. Um, Mancozeb or Maneb uh, are also very broad spectrum. Uh, they control all those, those leaf spot uh, diseases that, that I mentioned previously. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, you'll get, you'll get control with chlorothalonil or mancozeb for, for phyllospecta, absolutely, yeah. You, it'll kill on contact and then like something like dacanil or the weather stick formulation, it has some re, uh, residual because it's not systemic. So, but if you get it on the leaves and it's not washed off right away, uh, any, any spores that come on contact, they're not gonna germinate or infect. Yeah, it'll, it's a... Um, you probably don't have more than four days, because the sunlight's gonna break it down. You're, you're absolutely right, you're, you're absolutely right, yeah. You're, the, the sunlight, the, the irrigation, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so let me talk briefly about uh, bacterial uh, uh, diseases. Um, one of the things that's really important to, uh, this is another take home point, bacteria are actually single celled organisms. So these things are really tiny, um, much smaller than the fungi, and uh, they, they don't produce, at least the pathogens don't produce spores, so these are just cells, um, think of them as cells, and they can't get into the plant unless they have a wound or a natural opening. So often bacterial infections occur when you have mechanical damage from insects or you have a plant that has, you know, if the, the ideal situation is if the, there's stomates or hydathodes that are open and there's uh, moisture and water droplets, the bacteria get into the droplets and then they enter uh, through those natural openings. And that does happen and you can get systemic infection 
uh, once the, the cells are in, uh, enter into the plant. And so a classic example, I mean, this is a huge problem for plants that are being imported into the United States. I did a diagnostic training at the, uh, the APHIS, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, the, uh, the, um, the port. I went down there and, and because one of the issues is that there was a Vanda grower uh, in the, the middle of the state who had imported all these uh, beautiful uh, Vandas from Thailand. They came in, they looked spectacular in terms of the, the quality of the plants looked good. They hung them up and like a, within, within 48, 72 hours later, they started to rot. And because they had latent infection uh, with bacteria, they were watering them with canal water over there and that canal water had a lot of what's called, you know, used to be called Irwinia. Uh, and it, they, it got into the plants and it was the environmental conditions that turn that disease on. So you got to be really careful uh, with bacteria and you really have to have it confirmed by a lab. But, but one of the things I want to show you uh, is that there's some, there's some mi mild discoloration, very faint discoloration in, in the leaves here. And what happened is when the temperature uh, is just right, uh, the rot turns on. And I mean, these were some beautiful uh, orchids that just melted. And then this is an example here where you get a, uh, a yellow uh, halo. What this is, this is the zone of uh, advancement or initiation. So what's happening here is the bacteria probably got in through the wound. It's starting to rot all this tissue and it's moving where you see this halo. So you, if you were to come in, you would, you would, in essence, would just want to remove this entire leaf. But you, you definitely want to go in front of the, uh, the chlorotic area because this is where it's starting to infect new tissue. So you'd come in and just and lop that off uh, and remove it. It's the best, the best way. And of course, here, here's another example where it's moved. This, this is more even systemic where it's moved into the, the pseudobulb and, and just rot, rotting the, the whole plant. And then um, there are cases, uh, th this is um, Acidivorax. Uh, actually, uh, this is another one named after a, cat, a Cattleya. But in this case, this, this used to be a Pseudomonas, and now it's called a Pseudovorax. So you, you probably recognize the name Pseudomonas. One of the things uh, we see on, uh, we see it on Phalaenopsis, and we see it on Dendrobiums, uh, often during the wintertime, uh, it's a big problem. And you get, you get these pit-like circular spots with yellow halos. And so it just, it, it really uh, embeds down into the tissue. And, and this is a, an infection that occurs through the stomates. Um, when conditions are favorable in, in South Florida, it's during the wintertime. We have a heck of a time with, uh, with Acidivorax. Uh, and, and again, bacteria are like Fusarium, they're very difficult uh, to, to control. It's all about uh, application timing and having something if you're using the, the sulfur cinnamon mix or whatever, you'd want to put it out at the right time, to it kill on contact and prevent uh, uh, cells from getting in. One thing that's really uh, cool <laughs> is this is, a, this is a way to diagnose a bacterial disease, to separate it from a fungal disease, is that the, the tissue, when you have a bacterial infection, there are literally millions of cells of bacteria, and I mentioned they're, they're really tiny, in this tissue. So if you go through and you cut, and you can even take a leaf spot and just cut right through the center of uh, the, the margin of that, or right through the center of that spot, and put it in a clear glass. And what, what you're looking at here is this is not latex or plant sap. This, this is just millions of cells of this cloudy-like substance here of bacteria that comes screaming out of that, uh, that tissue. And you're not going to see this. If this is a fungal infection, there's, they're, they're not going to be there. Uh, you want to be careful if you're, you're doing this with a plant that has latex or uh, thick sap, you, you know, that's going to look like big globs. It's going to look completely different. This is very faint, almost smoke-like. That's a very good test 
to differentiate between a fungal infection and a bacterial infection. In, in general, but one of the problems with like, especially like with something as aggressive as like Phytophthora that moves in quickly, you get bacteria that move in secondarily. That, that's just like uh, uh, bud rot in palm trees. People think that if it smells god awful, it's bacteria and, it, and, and what's actually happening is the Phytophthora comes first, the bacteria move in secondarily. Bacteria do often stink though. The soft rot bacteria especially are really foul, but there are fungi that, that can clear rooms as well. <laughs> uh, if you've ever seen a stink horn in a, in a landscape, those are amazing and they, they will clear a building. Um, the, uh, so th the bottom line, uh, bacteria, uh, sanitation, sanitation, sanitation. It's all about clean, uh, um, you, you, you want to keep your collection uh, clean. You want to be careful about introducing uh, new things or maybe treat them before you introduce them to prevent problems uh, because uh, bacteria are very difficult uh, to control with chemistry. There's very few things that actually have bactericidal properties. Um, and uh, the, the big companies that produce these pesticides are always struggling with coming up with things for bacteria. It's generally copper, and, and mancos ever, like the two mainstays. But then you have all these disinfectants, things like Xeritol, things like uh, Clean Grow, which is a fourth generation quaternary ammonium product that actually uh, is, is safe on plants and, and does have uh, a bacteri bactericidal uh, properties. And so you, you have antibiotics, copper, biologicals, and the phosphonates that have some efficacy against uh, bacteria. Here's a number of uh, commercial, uh, commercially available um, uh, products that are good disinfectants and algicides. Pool chlorine is another thing that works really well. And you have a question in the back? Yeah, no, it, it is. It is actually. It's it's excellent. As a matter of fact, they've they've actually introduced some of that even into some potting. Uh, uh, there's formulations of potting mixes. Yeah, there's there's a number of of outstanding products, but agromycin is definitely uh, one that that's done well um, in in our trials. Don't uh, use it on uh, sorry. Don't use it on phalaenopsis. I don't know if I've I've used it on phalaenopsis. You've had phytotoxicity. Oh, absolutely. It's terrible. <laughs> it's really a bad one. We had major uh, litigation on that back in the I would say the sixties. It using uh, an, an antibiotic on phalaenopsis. Actually, it was agromycin, an early form of that. Don't do it. Wow! Wow! And I I'd have to look. It's fine on cat layers. Well, there's a. <laughs> I'm going to show you a, a website in a minute. <laughs> you mentioned pool chlorine. Pool chlorine, cheap, cheap. Uh, it's it's uh, well. I mean, there's a number. I wouldn't recommend spraying your plants with it. I don't know if anybody does, but from a disinfectant standpoint, it's a cheap, uh, broad spectrum yeah. disinfectant. Benches. Uh, you know, you get you get control of, of algae. You get yeah, it's a just a good disinfectant. I wouldn't use yeah. it on the pool because it's illegal. I mean, on a plant. Yeah. But it, it, the, the point of the formulation looks exactly like uh, any other quaternary ammonia compounds, except it's ten percent, not twenty percent. So you double the strength if you were to, uh, you know, misuse the label. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, I can't like recommend it in, uh, in writing, but you know, we, but I mean, I see what growers are using and we, we then do tests just to confirm that, that they are effective. So let me, uh, it looks like I got like five minutes. Um, pool algicide. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. The algicides are out, outstanding in general, uh, in, in some algicides are, are highly effective against Phytophthora because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a water mold, it's a different, uh, different organism. So, 
I, I can show you um, a link to a, a fact sheet that we have that has a lot more of this information on in terms of the, the, the products. Oh yeah, the um, uh, the Clean Grow uh, product. Uh, there's a there's a quaternary ammonium called Clean Grow uh, that I've done a number of trials on, and and it's uh, I've tested it on Phalaenopsis. I've tested on Vandas and had no had no problems with uh, phytotoxicity, and it, it's just like Xeritol in that it's all about that's the that hydrogen peroxide types. It's all about application timing. Um, sorry. The fi oh, the Fizan, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about it's all about timing. I mean, great. I mean, in terms of efficacy, it's lights out. It's, but but if you do not apply it at the right time, um, if you see evidence, you get in there early and you kill on contact. Uh, but residual activities is uh, where some of these commercial things that, that are uh, have a much longer uh, re re residual. Um, so let me just, okay, talk briefly about viruses because I know a lot of these uh, enthusiasts in here, um, and I, I know the previous speaker mentioned uh, a number of uh, times virus. Uh, viruses uh, are very difficult to diagnose. And I, I'm, I'm here to tell you uh, there are uh, symptoms associated with virus. But I have seen some really bizarre things uh, with both um, the tobacco mosaic virus, which is the odontoglossum ring spot on orchids, and, and cymbidium uh, mo mosaic. Cymbidium mosaic virus is, uh, is, is rampant. There's no, I mean, it's the, it's, the most, it's the number one virus associated with orchids. Uh, every survey that's ever been conducted, it seems like that one is, is the lead. Um, it's a potex virus, so it's very stable, um, and it's easily mechanically transmitted. Um, but the, the bottom line is, is that the symptoms associated with these viruses uh, are, are bizarre sometimes. And there, there are uh, maybe consistencies. You may have a species that you know spot on. This symptom is all, always 100% of the time associated with the virus. Uh, but then you have cases where you have the virus, and it's asymptomatic. Um, we've had, we've tested some beautiful orchids where I think there's nothing wrong with this plant, but in fact it does have a uh, virus. Did you just say the odontoglossum ring spot and tobacco mosaic virus are the same? Yeah, the odontoglossum ring spot, no, they're different. Oh. But the toba tobacco mosaic virus is actually, that tobacco virus, uh, when, when it was discovered on orchids, it, it, it's, it's different. And so it's called the odontoglossum ring spot virus, but some people refer to it as the orchid strain of tobacco mosaic virus. So when I say people, I, say, I mean virologists. Right. The reason I ask is because of the fact that, uh, from my understanding, the tobacco mosaic virus, is, it gets you kind of, you know, you can infect the plant, but it doesn't move. A problem that can cause is the infection. It just, it just moves through the whole plant, whereas the odontoglossum ring spot will actually it, move through the there's, there's variations on the theme. It depends on the plant. There's some cases where the virus will go systemic and other cases where it won't. So, yeah, yeah, it, depend, it depends on the plant. It, it, I mean, there's things that I learned when I was in graduate school that I thought were like the Bible, and then all of a sudden things change. It, it, it's always, there's always th uh, differences, but the, um, so it, the, well, let me, let me just move on quickly uh, and just mention viruses um, are, uh, of course, spread by insect vectors. That's one way. Some viruses are spread by, by insects. Some are not. Uh, some are spread through planting material and in mechanical means. Unfortunately, to, uh, odontoglossum ring spot and cymbidium mosaic virus are both widely spread by mechanical means. And uh, they're very, both very stable. Uh, odontoglossum ring spot is extremely stable and, and resilient, meaning that you know you can um, uh, you, you know that you, you you see signs going into greenhouses where they say no tobacco allowed because tobacco mosaic virus can actually be transmitted from the tobacco that's been cured, dried, whatever the process that's been done, and it and it survives that process. So um, so I just want to show 
some, some quick examples because I know I'm running out of time here. Um, just uh, oftentimes we see pitting associated with, uh, with cymbidium mosaic in the leaves. We see this as well with, with, um, with uh, odontoglossum ring spot. This is a phase that you can see this modeling or this uh, just kind of blended island of colors uh, is typical of, of virus. And of course, the, the color break in flowers is, is definitely uh, something we see with virus. And then, you know, I don't know, and I think that the gentleman that spoke before me would, would probably know a lot better than myself about the effects on longevity or, or shelf life of the flowers. I, 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 uh, I, I've not uh, been able to, we've done some, some studies where we've tried to trace it and we, we have uh, uh, virus free plants and plants with virus and we see no difference. No difference and at all. No difference at all. Now that's, uh, that's, been the, that's been the case. So I can't, you know, it's, um, it, it's really hard to say and I don't know if you can see it but there's faint ring patterns here. This is tomato spotted wilt virus. One, the one thing I want to end on uh, is that TOSPO viruses, tomato spotted wilt, tomato spotted wilt, tomato spotted wilt, uh, tomato spotted wilt with impatient necrotic spot viruses, which is another TOSPO virus, are on the rise in Florida. These are transmitted by thrips. Uh, gen most of them are western flower, th uh, flower thrips, but also the blossom thrips uh, can, can transmit or be the vector. Uh, the, the impatience necrotic spot, this is, uh, causes some devastating, it kills the tissue, so it causes that necrosis. Uh, so it's a real nasty bugger. And then most recently, we have tomato chlorotic spot virus that's been found in Phalaenopsis. This one is spread by the, by the blossom thrip, more so than the western flower thrips. This is devastating tomato production in, in South Florida. Uh, it, it was just a horrible year for, for tomato producers. But one of the, one of the things about Phalaenopsis, and I, I'm, uh, it seems to be the case, is that it does not move systemic. And, and so you can go in and just cut that symptomatic leaf. But if you have a Phalaenopsis that has this bright yellow chlorotic spot, uh, there's a good chance it could be the tomato chlorotic spot virus. I don't know how broad the host range is going to be for this one. This is a newly introduced virus, um, in, TOSPO virus in, in Florida. And uh, like I said, I can make this, this presentation available. Uh, Plantclinic.org uh, is a website. Oh, sorry. It's, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, www.plantclinic.org. That is the website to the diagnostic clinic. Um, in, at, uh, in Homestead, and um, that'll lead you to a lot of other resources. I've got a lot of uh, reference articles available online. Uh, just about every uh, disease I spoke about this morning is in a fact sheet, and so you can get all this information um, free just by uh, Googling is probably the easiest way to, to track it down. There's a question in the back. The, it's, it's killing the viburnum. Viburnum, the winter, something like that. So it's, all we've, we've had major outbreaks of downy mildew on both uh, viburnum odoratissimum and suspense. This year we saw it on suspensum. Uh, was it more, more during the winter and in, in like the fall, winter, spring, or are you seeing it now? I'd have to see. I, I suspect it could be remnants of downy mildew. I, yeah, I, I'd have to take a look. Uh, you, you're always stressing prevent, prevention, which is very good. So if you had to design an ideal plant house in your backyard, maybe you should put up a fact sheet about that. That's a, that's a really, yeah, that's a really <laughs> good point. <laughs>
No, I, I'll take that to heart. That's a good, yeah, we, we actually, uh, my first graduate student uh, was, he's a fanatical about orchids. He's working with cymbidiums now on the West Coast, but he came to me and he said, I knew he was a nut when he told me he spent more money on an orchid than he did on his car. And, and, uh, and, and so he kind of really opened the door. Uh, the Redland Orchid Festival actually f uh, gives me a lot of funding to support students. So one of the things uh, that would be great to get, a, to get a student to help me out with, uh, with putting together uh, an article like that, because there would be a lot to, that goes into it. But that's a... Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. If you can afford it, yeah, we just had new greenhouses put in, and that's one of the things that we put into the, the budget where the, yeah, it's, it, it's uh, from a maintenance standpoint, it's a night and day difference. That, that's a really good point. Yeah, there are some uh, um, stabilizers or, you know, because, yeah, you want to read the manufacturer's label because there are cases where if you've got, uh, like, your water's really alkaline, you, the, the product may not be working as well as it's supposed to. Uh, in, in rule of thumb, you want to try to get the pH of the water somewhere around 6.5 is ideal. Uh, but yeah, and we have alkaline water, at least in my area, so we, 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 we do use uh, things to drop the pH. Okay, other question. What about leaf tip dieback? Leaf, leaf tip, tip dieback. Leaf tip dieback. There's a number of possibilities. Uh, the, well, High temperature and the leaf tip. That, are you? Do you think it's a a, a fit on uh, on on a, on cattleyas or on on cattleyas? Um, it it's hard to say. It could it could be it could be the anthracnose uh, fungus. Um, it could be. Yeah. Calcium. I think we need to ask. Uh, <laughs> if your pH is, um, is low is enough, six. Well, six may not be enough. You may need to go to five point five to make it available, unless it's uh, especially. Uh, I don't want to say chelated; it's not a chelation process, but it has to be available. And if you've got yes. too much, uh, well, I understand between five point five and six point five. You got to run it down and learn. Oh, I think that's all it is. I think I have a problem. Yeah, we use we use a, the Dynagro products uh, really good. Probably learned that from from you guys. I think uh, you know. Uh,